What would Jesus do? This phrase is everywhere, on bumper stickers, bracelets, notebooks, laptops, and every other object that can theoretically have four words on it. The story of Jesus and the woman taken in adultery is one of the best known stories about Jesus in the Bible, but it only appears once in John 7:53 to 8:11. As the story goes, a woman is caught in the act of adultery and taken to Jesus. The scribes and the Pharisees, the greatest enemies of Jesus, ask him what to do with her. This, of course, is a trap. If Jesus tells them to let her go, he would be ignoring the law of Moses. If he says to stone her, he's going against his own forgiving nature. So, as the old mantra goes, what would Jesus do? Anyone who's read the story knows exactly what Jesus does. His response has become immortalized in movies, television, and novels. Jesus replies, Let the one who is without sin among you be the first to cast a stone at her. Or more famously, Let he who is without sin cast the first stone. It's an amazing story in which Jesus uses his wit to let himself and the adulterous woman off the hook. This story even has its own name, Pericope Adulterae, or P.A. for short. There is, however, one major problem with the story. It wasn't originally in John's Gospel, or any Gospel for that matter. It doesn't appear anywhere in our oldest and best manuscripts. It's certainly not from P66, a manuscript from the mid-2nd century, and it's certainly not in P75, a manuscript from the late 2nd or early 3rd century. These are our earliest manuscripts containing John chapters 7 and 8, and the story is absent from them. Likewise, the 4th century codices Sinaiticus and Vaticanus do not include the story. It's also missing from Syriac, Coptic, Gothic, Armenian, Old Gregorian, and Old Latin manuscripts. In fact, it's missing from over a hundred of our earliest manuscripts, so why in the world is it there now? The earliest manuscript we have that contains this story is from the 5th century in Codex Bizet, dating to around 400 CE. This is the earliest manuscript we have that contains the story and it places it in its traditional location in the Gospel of John. Not only is it the earliest occurrence of the story, it's the only manuscript that includes it before the 9th century. Codex Bizet is an interesting case in textual criticism. Bizet is the only extant manuscript with the story of Jesus speaking to a man who was working on the Sabbath after Luke 6.4. On the same day as he saw someone working on the Sabbath, he said, Man, if you know what you are doing, you are blessed, but if you do not know, you are cursed and a violator of the law. It also adds the specific number of steps which Peter walked on the street when an angel released him from prison, Acts 12.10. And it's the first manuscript to contain the longer ending of Mark, Mark 16, 9-20, although the last one is hard to determine. Throughout textual history, this story has been placed in different spots in the Gospels. Some manuscripts place the story at the end of John, others place it at the end of Luke, and yet others place it after its traditional location. It's clear, however, that people knew this story in some form or another from very early Christianity. In his Ecclesiastical History, written around 320 CE, Eusebius quotes a story known to him through the writings of Papias of Heropolis, an early bishop of Heropolis in Western Asia Minor. The same person, Papias, uses proof from the first epistle of John and from the epistle of Peter in like manner. And he also gives another story of a woman who was accused of many sins before the Lord, which is found in the Gospel according to the Hebrews. While this reference is brief and the description incomplete, Papias apparently knows of a story that circulated among early Christians that shared at least some parallels with the story of the woman taken in adultery. If this was the same story, according to Eusebius, Papias said it was in the Gospel of the Hebrews, a writing we no longer have, so this is a hard statement to analyze. Another source that gives a similar reference is a 3rd century text called the Didascalia Apostolorum, or Teachings of the Apostles. And when the elders had said another woman which had sinned before him, Jesus, and had left the sentence to him, and were gone out, our Lord, the searcher of the hearts, inquiring of whether the elders had condemned her, and being answered no, he said unto her, Go thy way therefore, for neither do I condemn thee. This Jesus, O ye bishops, our Savior, our King, and our God, ought to be set before you as your pattern. This story shares definite parallels with the Pericope Adulterae, but it also has major differences. The Johannine version implies that a woman was actually guilty of adultery, whereas the example cited in the Discalia Apostolorum 
supposes that the woman was actually innocent of whatever charges were being leveled against her, and it is not clear that it was necessarily adultery. Furthermore, the Johannine version refers to the scribes and Pharisees, while the Didascalia Apostolorum mentions the elders. In the former, the accusers leave as a result of a guilty conscience, whereas in the latter, they leave voluntarily so that Jesus can judge independently. Finally, in his commentary on Ecclesiastes, Didymus the Blind tells of a story even more similar to the P.A. We find, therefore, in certain Gospels, the following story. A woman, it says, was condemned by the Jews for a sin and was sent to be stoned in the place where that was customary to happen. The Savior, it says, when he saw her and observed that they were ready to stone her, said to those who were about to cast stones, He who has not sinned, let him take a stone and cast it. If anyone is conscious in himself not to have sinned, let him take up a stone and smite her. And no one dared, since they knew in themselves and perceived that they themselves were guilty in some things. They did not dare to strike her. There are many parallels to the PA here, but there are still a few differences. Didymus does not identify the charge as adultery, and the story is framed differently from how it appears in John. In John, the scribes and Pharisees seek to entrap Jesus and therefore bring the woman to him and solicit his opinion on the condemnation, whereas in Didymus' account, the Jews never seek out against Jesus' judgment. Rather, Jesus shows the initiative and intervenes on the woman's behalf. This story was clearly known to at least some of the early Christians, even though it doesn't appear in any extant manuscript. There were many early Christians, however, that had no idea this story existed, the most notable of which being the church father Tertullian. In the early 3rd century, he wrote On Modesty. It was an entire treatise on adultery and fornication and would certainly have needed to discuss P.A., but it simply doesn't even mention it. This absence suggests that Christians in 3rd century Carthage were not aware of the narrative. This is supported by the fact that nearly all Coptic versions of the text omit the story. So now we're left with the dilemma. There was a story circulating in some parts of the early Christian world, but not others. Not only was there a circulating story, but it was changing over time, and not only did it change over time, it was also placed in different Gospels during its transmission. How can we explain all this? Well, I suggest we start from the actual conception of the story. We are aware that some primitive version of this story was around in the early 2nd century. How did the story circulate? If we believe Eusebius' account that Papias references a similar story but in the Gospel of the Hebrews, all this starts to make sense. The Gospel of the Hebrews was most likely an Ebionite text. The Ebionites were a group of early Jewish Christians who either were born Jewish or converted to Judaism, who kept Jewish customs and strictly followed the Jewish laws, circumcision, Sabbath observance, kosher food, etc., but who believed that Jesus was the Messiah of God. More specifically, they thought that Jesus had been the most righteous man on earth. Because of this righteousness, he was adopted by God to be his son when he was baptized. The Gospel of the Hebrews and the Ebionites themselves portrayed the wrong view of Jesus, so they were deemed heretical views. It is well known that there were lots of debates and polemics in early Christianity about the nature of Christ, so this was an inevitable problem they would have to deal with. What would Jesus do? Would Jesus forgive, or would he punish? From very early on, Jewish Christians realized this problem, so they came up with this story that perfectly synchronized the law and Jesus' forgiving nature. The rest of the Gospel of the Hebrews didn't show the Jesus the Proto-Orthodox wanted to show. But they liked the story, so it became widespread in most of the early Christian world. The story had literally evolved from the mantra, what would Jesus do? And the result was mind-blowing. But that doesn't explain why it later became specifically adultery and not just sin. That's a question I do not know the answer to. After all, there are many sins in the Old Testament which require stoning as a punishment. There is one part of the PA that actually has a simple explanation of its later edition, the part where Jesus writes on the ground. Sometime in the late 3rd or early 4th century, the pagan communities began to criticize Christianity not only for its appeal to the lower class laborers, but also the literate status of Jesus himself. This would be the perfect time to add a story in which Jesus writes. The PA shows Jesus writing in another clever way, however. In all the stories in the Bible, God is the only one who had ever written with his finger. The insertion of that phrase was no accident. They were directly paralleling the story of God giving the Ten Commandments to Moses, in which God writes on the tablets with his finger. We will get back to this in a bit. <laughs> 
We are finally left with the question of why the pericope adulterae would sometimes appear in the Gospel of John and sometimes in the Gospel of Luke. This is most likely due to the lectionary traditions of the time. These traditions concern how priests would run their sermons. We already know that the story of Jesus and the adulteress initially confronted early Christians in some context other than the Gospel of John. Eventually, however, an interpolator inserted PA into John's Gospel at 7.53 to 8.11. This insertion created a situation where multiple early Christian authors acknowledged both PA's presence in the Gospel and that some manuscripts contain it while others do not. In fact, some manuscripts show that scribes would often use markers, something akin to an asterisk, to denote their suspicion of certain passages. If a certain manuscript left out the PA from their text but added it as a footnote or a marginal note, another scribe would come along and place the note into the text itself. These notes, however, were sometimes used in lectionary practice. If a certain preacher wanted to cover the PA during a sermon on Luke, they would place it there. If they wanted to do it while covering John, it would be placed there. This helps us understand why this passage was put in so many places over time. But this text was ultimately placed in John. There's actually a good reason for this. Although the text itself is non-Johannan, its placement in the Gospel was perfect. We discussed how some of this story was meant to parallel Moses and the Ten Commandments. But it's more than just writing with his finger that we need to discuss. After Moses smashes the original tablets, a new set is provided. Both times the tablets were written, but only one set was written with God's finger. Throughout John's Gospel, Jesus is contrasted with Moses, such as John 1.17. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And John 9.28 Then they reviled him, and said, Thou art my disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. Every time, Jesus is shown to be greater than Moses. In all of biblical canon, God is the only one described as writing with his finger until Jesus comes along. The story in the PA shows Jesus as not a mere recipient of the law, but the author of it. In conclusion, the patristic evidence demonstrates that at least by the 2nd century, certain Christians were aware of the story about a condemned woman who appeared before Jesus and whose punishment was subsequently nullified or mitigated as a result of the encounter. Yet the similar story in John cannot be deemed original to that gospel. The ancient manuscript evidence speaks against it, and the story contains literary features that suggest non-Johannan authorship. Different earlier versions of the story suggest that its current form in John is not the original version. The story evolved into its present form and was added to John in the 4th or 5th century because its core had an ancient pedigree and its appeal to mercy over punishment was attractive. But the story itself may have originated from the fan favorite mantra, what would Jesus do? Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe, check us out on Facebook and Twitter, and if you really love us, consider supporting us on Patreon. Check out our new website, milwaukeeatheist.com, and we'll see you next time.